you are likely aware as people age, they tend to lose hearing. Some do, some don't, but it's, it's a fairly common condition, common enough that we call it presbyacusis. And presbyacusis uh, feels as though it's, it's, it's sort of bound to happen, at least for those of us who's, uh, who, who have a parent with presbyacusis. Um, but in fact, it's, it's not, it, it is not inevitable. And there was a very uh, um, revealing story, a uh, revealing study uh, by Sam Rosen and Pekka Olin, where they studied two people, two groups of people. One were these uh, a tribal people living in a, in a non-modern um, setting, so no electricity, no cars, no modern um, uh, noises, essentially. And then they studied people going to the Wisconsin State Fair. So um, modern people, not particularly, people going to a state fair may not be the most urban of all people, but um, people that used farm machinery, used cars, etc. And what they found was these are, these are audiograms. So what you're, le what you're reading here is this is zero decibels. And zero decibels is basically where the threshold for hearing should be, ideally. And this is going from 500 to 6 kilohertz. 500 to 6 kilohertz in sound. So this is across the speech range. And this is a curve for people that are 10 to 19 years old. And this bottom curve is for people that are 70 to 79 years old in the Mobin uh, tribe. And here are the comparable curves for people in Wisconsin. Here's 10 to 19, and here's 70 to 79. So for a, a 70, somebody, the average person is 70 to 79, if they want to hear something at, say, 4 kilohertz, it has to be 20 dB for the mobbin. And for um, a person in Wisconsin, it has to be over 70 dB. So we're talking a, a very substantial difference. What is the source of the difference? Well, one obvious possibility is that modern life is noisy. And these are just some, uh, some um, the noise level of some common uh, occurrences in modern life, such as a car horn. That's uh, 120 dB. Uh, a rock band a machine shop, a train. Some of us ride trains every day, a vacuum cleaner, conversation. And, and then more, um, uh, more louder things such as a jackhammer and so on. So these are noise levels that we're exposed to all the time. And one thought, one common thought is that the reason people lose their hearing is because of all the noise that that a person is exposed to over time. But there are lots of other differences between the Mobbin people and uh, people at a Wisconsin State Fair. So other differences include genetics and uh, environment and diet. And what appears now to be the case is that hearing loss occurs, presbyacusis occurs where there's this meeting of a susceptibility to noise damage due to genetics, diet, and so on, um, and sufficient noise exposure. So you can't have, you can have sufficient noise exposure but not have the susceptibility, or you can have the susceptibility without um, the noise exposure. And either way, you get to the same, you might, you get to the same point. So what is going on here? One I idea was that when noise, a really loud noise came in, it was so powerful that it sheared off the hair cell bundle of the outer hair cells. And remember that the hair bundle of the outer hair cells is embedded in the tectorial membrane. So if, that, if there's enough of a, of a sound wave, think of a tsunami of a very powerful wave, that can just get sheared off. And that seemed like a good idea, but it doesn't appear to be the case. And so what now appears to be the case is that there are a number of, of insults um, that accumulate. And they don't, we don't know what one person's threshold is. Um, we can't predict one person's threshold 
And that is to say that there is not a single threshold where hearing damage does occur in everybody. It differs. It differs by these various factors. So in cases where hearing damage does occur, how does it occur? What we, what we now think is that there are these transient hearing losses and that these are, that while they are transient and while hearing comes back, they are doing permanent damage. So here's how it works. You go to a rock band, uh, you go to a rock concert, and then and after you get out, you, you're, what was that? Uh, what was that? You ha you, you're not, you're not, uh, you don't hear quite as, uh, as easily even when you're in, in a no background, even as you get out of it. And that may endure for, for a day. And I just want to share with you one um, anecdote. This is a, a use of transient uh, hearing loss that was uh, used in the Revolutionary War by the Americans where they didn't know that they were using this. But after eight hours of firing cannons, both armies were more than a little deaf. If uh, the Americans muffled their oars, the British were unlikely to hear them rowing past. They would do exactly what the British least expected. Sail, so the Americans just rowed right through the enemy lines, and they could do that because um, the British were transiently deaf, as were the Americans. So what, is, what effect does that have? Well, as it, what we now think is that that effect is that this inner hair cell is now pouring out when, when in response to these very loud sounds, it's pouring out neurotransmitter to the uh, spiral ganglion cell. And this, uh, this synapse then essentially is exposed to excitotoxicity. Remember that glutamate causes excitotoxicity in, in the recipient um, molecule, too much calcium. Uh, and so this terminal gets sick, it swells, and it can rupture. And if it dies, that's it. Can't hear. That, that afferent is offline. So you're going to lose afferents. As these, as these terminals die, as they swell, rupture, and die, you will progressively lose hearing. So um, that's how hearing loss, most hearing loss is thought to occur. What we're now going to go on and talk about is cochlear implants.